Okay, Dondra, gold stock data. Let's continue on. This is part two, how to invest in gold and silver mining stocks. So it's taking a little bit longer than I thought it was gonna take. The first uh, video was an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> it's turned into a class. So part two, I'm gonna do slides 14 through 27. Hopefully you can get it done within an hour. <laughs> so in the last part three, slides 28 through 44. So bear with me, um, take some time to get through this material. Okay, so these are the various categories. I'm going to talk about some of the important factors of each category. So the first category I'm talking about is producers. What you're looking at on producers is um, growth and free cash flow. So it's, it's tough for small producers to um, have significant cash flow. So I try to find, try to look for companies that are either going to be 100,000 ounce producers or already are. Um, I will go down to say, say 50,000 ounces to 100,000 ounces um, for some stocks, but those are kind of the outliers. Uh, the only reason I'm really buying those is because they're cheap. They're just really undervalued, but that's not really where I'm get excited. So a hundred thousand ounce producer should be worth somewhere between 500 million and $1 billion um, at say $2,500 gold, depending on the location, depending on the, on the balance sheet, depending on the cost. Um, and you can even, let's say a, a company, has a low cost, good location, good balance sheet, it could actually be valued over a billion dollars. Um, that's not unusual. And so in those factors I'll come in. So this is kind of the range. And then again, 200,000, you can pretty much double it. And then again, 300, 400, you can just keep going up the ladder. It gives you a general understanding of the value of a producer. Um, and so, we're looking for companies that can add ounces because I talked about this earlier. If you can find ounces for $25 and then you can get them valued at 500, the leverage is huge on upward valuation. So those are, that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for production ounces, growth, um, and then of course uh, getting in at the right price get, where you have your upside potential. Um, and I think we're going to talk about that as well. So for development stocks, uh, you're looking at um, the, uh, the main value drivers are trying to, um, once they get into production, you don't want to get a small company per se, like, you know, a real tiny CapEx, um, unless it um, has the growth potential to get to 100,000. So we're looking for companies that have, you know, fairly decent starter mines. So a starter mine is usually somewhere with a capex between 50 million and 200 million. And then once you get over 200 million, the capex starts getting big. And the large capex, you know, it's going to require high dilution, high debt, and a long time to build. So I don't really like on these development. When I talk about development, I'm talking about first-time mines. I'm looking for a starter mine. I really, you know, there are some development projects where you go, you know, higher than 200 million, but those are the outliers. The sweet spot is like, like I said, 50 to 200. You're looking for those sweet spots where they can basically start production somewhere between, you know, say 75,000 to 150,000 ounces of gold. And then they have growth potential on top of that. So they can get to 100,000, they can get to 200, they can grow. So that's kind of like the starter point. The IRR, it's important. You want to avoid low IRR projects. This is the internal rate of return. So anything that's sub 20%, the only time you really want to be interested in something like that is if it's an optionality play and they have a lot of resources and they're really cheap. Then, I'm, then I could go down to, you know, say 15% IRR at $1,300 gold. Um, I don't have a problem with that if it's, if it's a lot of resources in, because all of that, it all becomes economic once you get higher. Um, 
I, I still look at IRs at $1,300 gold. I know we're going to start to get above that, $1,400, $1,500. I even saw one company do an IR at 1800 I thought that was a little hilarious. I thought they were getting ahead of themselves there. Um, but it'll start inching up here. But yeah, so uh, you, ideally you want to see, like I talked about these starter projects here, you want to see these IRs um, say over 30% gives you some comfort zone. That, that way they're going to get built. Um, if, a, if a company has an IR under 30, it's going to be really hard for them to finance the mine. Banks just aren't going to be interested. Usually anything over 30 um, at $1,300 gold, they can usually raise the money and not always. I've seen, it, it just depends on the company. Um, sometimes they can have a 40% IR and have some trouble. But 30 is usually kind of a good area. You can be have a, can feel comfortable that these projects will get uh, financed. Um, the MPV, what you're looking for here is you want the MPV to be substantially higher than the CapEx um, and substantially higher than the current market cap. So let's say the MPV is uh, 200 million and their CapEx is 150 million. So it's just a little above it. And then the market cap is like 80 million. So that's kind of that's kind of marginal, but what you would like to see is even bigger. You'd like to see the MPV like a 300 million and then the, the, the CapEx like at 150. So that's like double, maybe even the CapEx at 100 million and then the current market cap like under 100 million. You just want that, you want to see some air between the MPV and, and their CapEx. If you see an MPV and then the CapEx and the market caps are like all around the same place, that's, that's just not, not going to have a lot of upside potential. It's, the, the key ones is, is the CapEx and the MPV, but the market cap, I always look at that as well because the MPV is, that's where the value is going, right? So if, if, so if, if the current market cap is 100 and the MPV is 200, it's basically saying it's only, only going to go up 100%. So you really want a lot of, I like to see the MPV well, well above these two numbers. So I always look at, look at all these are the kind of the three important there's other factors that come in development stocks of course like the insiders but th these are some of the important ones to look at um, exploration stocks so location um, can they drill year round i know up in canada a lot of the you know yukon none of it some of these cold places alaska you know they can't drill year round i i prefer you know when they can it's tough, you know, the golden triangle. I mean, when they're only drilling six months of the year, it makes it really tough to kind of get ahead. That's kind of a, a, a kind of a downer, even though I, I do like those areas. Um, I like the Yukon and, and um, the golden triangle in, in British Columbia. But um, that's the one thing about location. Um, can, you know, can they drill around? The other one about the location is it can it cost extra money um, if there's no roads. So that's another issue for exploration stocks. You know, is it easy to get to? Um, you know, that those are kind of be, can be issues. Size of the property. Um, I actually talked about this earlier. So less than a thousand acres kind of turns me off. I, I like to be you know one thousand or higher. Number of targets. I always like it when there's a lot of drill targets. Right, the more the better. You know, they say they have 20 drill car targets over, you know, a five kilometer trend. That's the more the better. Geology, you know, is the geology conducive, you know, for discoveries? That's where, you know, they'll tell you, the CEO will tell you about the geology, give you some pictures and say, you know, look, this is, this is where I drill hole and the geology goes, you know, all the way down here, you know, and so, so you really want, you know, is it conducive? That's where, kind of where Mexico comes into play. You know, Mexico's got fantastic geology for silver discoveries. Um, uh, drill results, I'm gonna have a separate slide for this. A uh, buzz, you know, it, are people talking about it? Are people excited about it? You don't wanna be the only person that owns it. Uh, the chart, you know, is it trending? Has it already broken out? You, you have to decide, you know, are you buying and too, are you too late really? And then are you too early? So if you're too early, the, the chart's flat, right? It's not doing anything. And if you're too late, it, you know, it's went straight up. Maybe you're a little too late. So you want to look at the chart, cash in the bank. You know, these companies are exploration. They're always raising money. It's always nice when they have like 20 million. It's always a great sign for an exploration company that's got a lot of cash. And then the other one is the share price. So if it's like over a dollar, that makes it easy for them to raise money versus a company that's at 10 cents or less. If you're, you know, 10 cents or less, you're going to dilute the heck out of your shares, right? So we like to see a share price over 50 cents, like ideally over a dollar, makes it easy to raise money. And the ease of raising money, some of these companies, 
have no problem. And you can tell by if it's a full warrant or a half warrant. These companies are paying full warrants. That's not good. That just means they're having trouble raising money. You know, it's really nice when you see an exploration company that doesn't need warrants. That's kind of rare, but it happens. You only want a, a half warrant. And then, you know, they'll tell you how easy it is for them to raise money. Big name investors is always nice when, like, you know, Eric Sprott's involved or another big name or Ross Beatty, something like that. And there are enough insiders. I've, I've talked about that before. Um, royalty companies. So, you know, what is the current margins um, and expected margins? They're usually always going to be really high, you know, generally around 80%. So you want to look at their income, you know, how, how, what's their current cash flow, um, you know, what, what's their current cash flow, and then what is their current multiple? Most of these companies are valued around 25x. They just have really high, really high multiples based on these high margins, but, you know, you want to see around 80 percent and 25 that's just normal and then are they growing you know what is the expected growth um some of these companies are pretty good at uh, doing deals and growing um, they grow consistently um but so you see want to work, look at the growth rates you know how many projects do they have under development what what what, are, what is their expected growth rate so all these three numbers are really going to give you a good idea of you know how this company is going to do and then they expected gold silver prices. So they, are, they have high margins, right? So if gold and silver prices go up, so will these guys. If they have, they have you know, they have all of this, um, then that's kind of what you're looking for with royalty companies, but they need to have all, all you know, all three of these. These are, they need to have all three of these, you know, and then you can go with the growth. Uh, majors. Um, so we're looking, now we're gonna look at some risk differences between these categories. So majors, um, as far as looking at kind of risk issues, differences. So the, the majors have the least amount of risk, of course, and the reason why is because their balance sheets are stronger than the other companies. They tend to, you know, they can generally survive uh, downturns. Um, but the location of political risk can be sub substantial. So you need to look into that. They're not going to get as valued as high. They're not going to have that 25x cash flow multiple, maybe even not 20x but definitely not 25 if they have political risk. They're just not gonna get there, right? They're not gonna get that. Investors aren't gonna give them that value. Um, high debt, you got some of these companies have $2 billion in debt or more. So that's an issue. Um, it, 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 uh, something that you have to pay attention to because um, you know they burn through their cash or they spend their cash on building a project or they pay high dividends and suddenly their, their debt can become an issue. Legal issues, uh, companies, a lot of times we'll have permit issues or legal issues that they have to deal with and it's kind of hampering the hampering the value of the company. So you got to always see if there's anything there. Uh, high cost um, uh, can act like negative leverage. So if, if what I mean by negative leverage is that if the gold price drops, then high cost companies get hit hard. So it's kind of a, you know, they can get leverage in both directions. So the price, they're very, basically they're undervalued and the price of gold goes up, so they go higher. And then, but the opposite happens. They have a lot of negative leverage because the price of gold goes down, they get, they get hammered. So you gotta be aware of that. This is how the high cost can really impact these stocks. They, they can go down further. Um, so, okay, so mid-tier producers, all the issues that I mentioned up here uh, apply to, apply to mid-tiers as well. Um, they tend to have weaker balance sheets than majors, um, but not always, but they tend to. Um, and they have, tend to have less credit than the larger companies. The larger companies, they tend to have a credit line. You don't see a lot of credit lines with the, the mid-tiers. It's not as easy for them to go out and, you know, raise, you know, $200 million uh, in debt, for instance, credit line. Not as easy for them. Um, and then they have the higher probability of bankruptcy, so you have more risk involved. But if it's a stronger, if they have a strong balance sheet, then it can make them, um, you know, the risk isn't as high. It can be almost equal to that of a major, depending on the quality of the properties and, and their balance sheet and the cost structure. Um, less financial strength can hinder a mid-tier producer from from growing. I've seen this a lot. So this is on the, on the lower end of the mid-tiers. So if you have a company that's say mid-tiers, like has a market cap, say 200, 250, 300 million, but yet they don't have, their cost structure doesn't allow them to have a lot of free cash flow and, and they have debt and they're just struggling really to get ahead, um, to, to get struggling to, to pay off their debt, to clean up their balance sheet, 
to increase production, kind of spinning their wheels, trying to, you know, trying to, you know, grow. You'll see, I see this a lot in the lower end mid tier companies. You got to pay attention to the, pay attention to that and look for the companies that are kind of, you know, trending, if you will, kind of um, making um, strides, if you will, for nothing's slowing them down. Nothing's really hindering them. You know, you want to look for what, you know, what's hindering this company. Uh, what are the issues that are hindering it? Um, it's important that these companies have positive free cash flow and significant positive free cash flow. I mean, $10 million a year really isn't get, it's not really cutting it. You want to have, you know, 25, 50 million in, in free cash flow. That's going to, you're going to clean up your balance sheet. That's going to add cash to your balance sheet. It's going to make it, you know, to where you can find a way to grow. So you want to look for that positive free cash flow. If they don't have any right now, you want to look for, you know, when are they going to get it? What are the steps they're going to need to get that positive free cash flow? Uh, another thing to to be cognizant of is that once a gold miner falls out of favor, it can be difficult to recover. Um, you know, once it, once they once once a company starts having problems and their share price drops, it's really tough for them to to recover and to get investors back and get investors interested in them again. It's like once a company becomes a dog, it's, 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 it's a tough road to get back. It can take some time. I think that's my point. Emerging mid tiers. Um, so these stocks can have, these stocks can provide opportunities because they're usually undervalued if they're an emerging mid tier, unless it's, you know, the only reason they're emerging is because they just haven't built the mine yet and the growth is there and their you know, investors are excited. But a lot of times uh, investors aren't excited with these companies because they're, they're not mid-tiers yet and they're essentially small producers. And so you know, there's not a lot of quality companies in this category, but you can find some that are you know, grow, gonna grow. So you just have to look for you know, what is that growth opportunity? Um, and then what are, you know, what are the risk? So all the risk associated with small producers apply here as well. You know, they can have, uh, I'll just go ahead and go down to the small producers and talk about that. So um, it's okay to bet on a few small producers. Uh, you can all have a few in your portfolio, but don't expect those to really be your home runs. Um, these are these are just stocks you, you, know, you can't kind of pass up. They're just really cheap. Um, you know, a company like Impact Silver, it's like when it was really cheap, I was like, I got to buy this because it's going to do well. I mean, it's, it's probably not going to be a mid-tier producer, but it's just so cheap. But you, the entry level is really important. Um, it's just, it's just it's, you just don't want to pass it up. And you never know, you know if they can grow. Some of these small producers have potential to grow. And it just, you're kind of locking in like a three plus bagger and who knows, it could be better. Um, they usually have low resources. Um, it, it, and that's the reason why they are small, small producers, but some of them can have exploration potential. They generally tend not to have, they generally tend to have weak balance sheets because they just don't have a lot of free cash flow. Um, but that's the reason why they get so cheap and that's why they become so compelling because they have a weak balance sheet, they have low resources, so they get valued at, you know, a dollar an ounce, say for silver, you know, $20 an ounce for gold, and you're going, this company is just too cheap, I gotta buy it. Um, so especially if they have expiration potential, then, you know, it can be interesting. So you're just looking for, you know, you're looking for opportunities. And again, you just, you know, you just didn't want a lot of them, small, you just a few of them. And those aren't really gonna be your, kind of your home runs. Late stage development companies. so. Um, these can be exciting opportunities with, with big upside potential. Um, however, with that upside potential come, becomes risk. I mean, you're looking at development company stories where the, their current valuation um, is nowhere near where it's going to be when they get to first pour. So you got this big gap, right? And, and that's one of the reasons that why they're so enticing. But getting to first pour is not easy. And, and you're taking a risk getting there. And a lot of times these companies, they, they spend a lot of money to develop these projects. So there's a lot of share dilution and you can end up actually losing money on, the, on these stocks, even though they have huge upside potential, but the dilution will, 
will hurt the share price as as they how much the money it costs it costs money to do pre pre feasibility studies and and it costs money to um, do infill drilling and do permitting and all this money uh, it requires uh, share dilution so the earlier you get in in the late stage the more risk you have so try to focus on projects that have a path to production within three years ideally less than two years and the closer production the, le um, the less upside however the closer the, the production the less upside potential you know once in a while you just have to get in early because it just makes sense i remember i got into pure gold when it was trading at 10 cents and you know i just i just got in real early i was like i, I like this project it's gonna it's gonna be a winner but the who knows how much dilution there was going to be who knows if it gets taken out you know it worked out great i mean it's trading you know, over a dollar fifty right now i think um probably heading to three three dollars or more so it's been a really good investment but that one winner that one home run um you have you know three or four losers or three or four you know duds if you will so late stage, there's a lot of risk involved because you're going after really big returns. And the, again, the longer the production, the more share, chance of share dilution. So if you can find one that's, you know, within two years of production, within one year, you know, they really start to make sense. Like I remember Skeena, I got into Skeena and Arcana and Ascot, you know, one, when those project, projects were fairly advanced and they were still very cheap. Sometimes you can find these projects that are, you know, within, you know, two, three years and they're very cheap. Those are the ones that I like. Um, anything that's more than three years, the risk really starts to go up. And I've talked about this several times about the insider ownership. Uh, location is really important uh, to determining the rip permitting risk. You know, you're in some, a lot of times you're going to get these development projects before they're permitted. So depending on where it's at, that's going to tell you how long, for instance, the US, it takes forever to permit in the US, the longest anywhere in the world. Um, everywhere else is, you know, you know, two to three years per kind of the US is like four to five years. Those are those are just general generalizations, of course, but on the whole. Um, so it, it, it really makes me nervous um, trying to <laughs> waiting, you know, buying a development project in the US that isn't, the permitting hasn't started yet. Boy, those take forever. <laughs> um, high CapEx project. Um, so the higher the CapEx, remember I said that I only like to go back to 200 million. So once you get over 150 million, you know, that high CapEx can really, can really slow a project down from getting financed. It also can create a lot of share dilution and, and hurt your upside potential. Exploration projects. Okay, on slide 15, the one that I just went over, I talked about all these factors for exploration stocks. Um, one thing to keep in mind is it's very difficult to find a large mine, very hard. And so, um, and that's what we want. We want. That's where you make your money, right? When they find a large mine and it's very difficult to find one. So there are about 500 quality exploration companies in the world, and perhaps one or two of them will find a large discovery this year. That's it, one or two. So, you know, how, how many are you gonna own, right? What are the chance? Chances of you, you know, of somebody finding, it's, it's just really, really difficult. Um, so you have, to, you have to think of these exploration stories as lottery picks. Um, if you're, if you're going to chase your results, make sure the company already has the goods. Uh, you should be chasing the size of the mine and not the mine. Um, that's a really important lesson. The size of the mine and not if it is a mine. In other words, okay, we see these good results. We know there's a mine there. It's just a matter of how big it is. Those are the, those are the good ones. Um, a good discovery can trend for months. Um, consider the Great Bear discovery in 2018. It trended from 30 cents in, 20, in August 2018 to $15 in July 2020. It trended for two years of drill results. And you know that's what you can find. So you, as long as you bought this thing at two bucks, you did great. You, you had a lot of time to get in. So that's kind of what you're looking for. Royalty. Okay, so. All right, so um, the one thing about risk, one thing about royalty companies is the royalty model has been working great, but it's been expanding. I think now I have like 16 royalty companies in my database. I had like five when I first started. 
it just keeps get growing and growing and growing. And it's like two, three every year we get new royalty companies. So it's becoming very competitive. Everybody's kind of starting to compete. It's getting crowded. What that's going to do is it's going to slow growth because these companies are going to have to share, share the projects. Plus they're going to start having to, they're competing against each other. So they're going to have to bid a little bit lower. They might have to pay a little bit more. So it's becoming a crowded field, which um, is going to carry um, kind of more risk. Um, it's currently, though, if the model holds, it probably has kind of the lowest risk because their costs are extremely low. They don't; most of them have very little debt on their balance sheet and very high margins. So, and as the price of gold goes higher, their their cash flow is going to go right. You know. 80% um, margins goes straight into their balance sheet. They can pay high dividends, which is going to generate higher share price values. So as long as the model holds and the price goes up, you know, the risk looks pretty good for these companies, but um, there is increased competition. And so there's always that possibility that growth slows in the model. Like right now, the, mo the model's been working so well that most of these companies are valued at 20x, 25x um, free cash flow, even as high as 30. So will that hold? Uh, you have to think in terms, you know, the model, um, you know. And then the final risk is I think there's a possibility that the royalty model could be challenged in court. And so, and I'll give you an example. So. Let's say that you're a producer and you have a, and, and you're producing like 10 million ounces of silver and you're only getting paid f the stream, you, all that silver, 10 million, you're only getting back, um, you have to give all of it to in the contract because for the life of the mine, you have to give all your silver production and you're only getting paid $4 an ounce for that silver. And let's say silver goes to $50. Um, that is a huge, the other guy is getting $46. I'm just using 50 as an example. He's getting $46 times 10 million. Um, is that $460 million? Um, free cash flow. And you're going to keep giving that company all that silver? I wouldn't. I would stop. So now I would stop sending my, I would stop sending that silver royalty to that company. I would stop. And I would basically say, call my lawyer. And, the, and when he called my lawyer, the lawyer said, okay, we want to renegotiate. <laughs> and if they said, no, we don't want to negotiate, the lawyer say, okay, we'll see you in court. And so I would basically pay those legal fees and say, I'm not paying. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then if the court was going to find me, if I ended up losing, um, you know, the court might make me pay a penalty and interest and the whole deal. But, I, you know, it would probably be worth it for me to, to and, and who knows it might take I'm, I might be able to hold hold them up in the courtroom for a year or two you know and they're supposed to get 460 million dollars so I think it would be conducive for them to rewrite um, rewrite the contract I think someone's going to do that and once someone's successful doing that the whole mar the whole model starts to break down so that's my two cents of what I think is going to happen once say silver gets over 50 I think somebody somebody just stops pain and says, I want to rewrite on this contract. So we'll see what happens. Um, okay, so we got uh, five more, five more uh, slides here. I think we're going a little faster than last time. Okay, so part one, finding undervalued. So how do we find undervalued mining stocks? The first one, number one is future free cash flow versus the current market cap. So once you under, underestimate the future free cash flow, you can compare it as a multiple to the current market cap. And I do this um, on GSD, it, it shows you that number. So I can just look, you know, go to the company's profile play, page and look at it, but you could do it manually. As well. So here's how you calculate the future, the future free cash flow. You take expected annual production, you estimate it. You take the estimated future gold price. I'm using $2,500. Use the all-in cost per ounce. I showed you in part one how to calculate that. And then you multiply it out. One, this is a, an example of 100,000 ounces. And we have our all-in cost, 2,000 minus 20. Oh, I'm using $2,000 gold minus 1,200 all-in cost. 
is 80 million in future free cash flow. So I'm being conservative here. I'm not using the 2,500. Um, I usually do that on Seeking Alpha. I'll be con conservative and use 2,000 so people don't jump on me. <laughs> okay, so we have 80 million in future free cash flow. You compare that to the current market cap. Say the current market cap is 160 million. The multiple would be a two. So what's it gonna be in the future? It's probably gonna be at least a five, right? So anything two or less I consider undervalued because a company can be expected to be valued with at least a 5x multiple. And sometimes much higher, it can be 10x, 15x, right? So this is, this is the first method, future free cash flow versus current market cap. And you're looking for two, two or less is what you're looking for. The second valuation method is the, is the current future market cap growth rate. And this one to me is just as important as number one. I, I like to compare, I like to look at both of them and kind of compare them side by side. So the first thing we need, we need the future market cap. To um, calculate the future market cap, we take the future goal price, we subtract out the future all in cost per ounce, and then we multiply the future production ounces. Then we multiply the cash flow multiple. So here, if we do an example here, the cash flow, oh, well, the cash flow multiple is dependent on the quality of the company. So an average company would be five, a strong company would be 10, and a great company would be 15. And if we get lucky, we might see 20 and 25 down the road if gold, if gold prices go to the moon, right? But today, the highest I really do is 15. You might do 20 on a major, really good major, but, and then royalty companies are like 25. Okay, so here's an example. So you got, Gold price 2,000, all in cost 1,200, so that's 800 times 100 million ounces, and then a multiple of five, and you get 400 million. So this is an estimated future market cap, 400. Then you compare that to the current market cap, and it gives you the estimated growth rate. So if we compare four, um, if we compare the 400 million to the current market cap of 80 million, you get. 400%. Uh, so you get the change, you subtract out these two, which is the change, the change in growth, divided by the current, um, the starting point, the market cap, you get 400%. So that's the growth rate, 400%. That's how you calculate it out. The third way is to calculate the value of the gold or the silver in the ground. So to do this, you, you take all three of those values and it gives you a pretty good understanding of, of if it's, if it's undervalued. So first, you estimate the future reserves. You estimate the future reserves um, based on their current M&I and future, the, the existing futures um, come out of M&I. So you look at the M&I and then you look at the reserves. This is the way I do it. And then you identify what you think they're gonna produce of those numbers. Um, and so usually what I'll do is I'll only use M&I Sometimes I'll use M and I, and then a little bit of uh, I'll pad it a little bit with the with the um, inferred if I think that the inferred is going to increase the M and I. Um, so this is dependent on a number of factors. You know, do you think the inferred will become reserves? That's a big question. Second, do you think they will find more gold, which will become reserves? So basically, you are guessing, estimating how many ounces you think they will mine in the future. Once you have that number, you divide it by the current market cap. So if you have you estimate out the future reserves at 5 million ounces, you divide by the current market cap, 100 million, you get $20. So anything less than $50 is cheap. I'm looking for, yeah, I'm looking for under 50. Although if it's a big producer, I might go from 50 to 100. But for most companies, I'm looking 50 or lower. These are my five baggers. If I'm looking for a three bagger, I might go 50 to 100. So it, it just depends if I'm looking for a three bagger or a five plus bagger. I look for three baggers for diversifying my portfolio to make it stronger. Um, sometimes I like to do that. I like to have strong producers. If I can buy them cheap, if I can buy them on sale, if I can buy the dip, you know, if I can buy a Yamana on, on, on a dip or, um, you know, something like that, maybe a Ken Ross, a big company on the dip that's, you know, really cheap, then I might, you know, pay $100 an ounce if I can find it, you know. Um, it is common to find gold in the ground below $10. These are when it's really, really cheap. This usually only occurs when gold does not have a path to production. So the risk goes up. Um, those are optionality plays. For anything 
silver, anything less than $2 is cheap. So when you combine all three of these valuation methods, it's fairly easy to identify an undervalued company. However, this should be the only, only be the starting point. Then you have to identify any red flags that could prevent this upside from coming to fruition. Those red flags are the risk factors I mentioned previously. So yeah, a company can look cheap, but that doesn't really necessarily mean it's a good investment. Okay, quick and dirty. So this is a little, le a little um, method of comparing um, two producers or two developers, but this one here is two producers. So we look at the three valuation methods. So let's say you're, gonna, you're looking at two producers and you're trying to decide which one you want to invest in. I remember one time I was comparing, this was in 2009, I was comparing First Majestic Silver and Aveno Silver. No, yeah, I think it was those two. And after I um, weighed and um, looked at him, it was like, it was no comparison, right? It was like First Majestic kind of just stood out. Um, but that was before First Majestic really took off. At that point in time, First Majestic had a market cap of $150 million and Avena was like a hundred, I think. Um, but it turned out when I looked at them, I mean, you look at them, so you look at the three valuation messes that I just mentioned, then you compare their management teams, you know, who's executing better, who's more short shareholder focus. Then you look at their all in cost, current and future. You look at their balance sheets, compare their balance sheets, look at the properties, then the pipeline, who has a better growth potential, look at the resources, look at the grade and the size. You know, you look at all these right now, and then one of the companies will stand out. You'll say, okay, if I'm going to compare these two producers, that's the one I want. Um, building a portfolio. So in my book, I talk about a pyramid approach, and I've been using this from the very beginning. Uh, and it, I think it works fantastic for, for um, creating um, diversification, not necessarily having the best returns, but you know, gold and silver mining stocks are very risky. So I like to have divert, like to diversify. Um, so this approach uses diversification with more weight at the bottom of the pyramid to limit risk. So at the bottom of the pyramid is the, the base, the foundation. And this is where you want to have cash, bullion, sovereign coins. So this is, this is kind of the very low risk. Notice there's no mining stocks here. Then the next one up is uh, your large cap producers. And this can also be um, your mutual funds um, and can be your ETFs. I'm, su I'm surprised I don't have that on here. Um, that should be actually after the bottom. And then after that, so this is your foundation. Your foundation is basically your large caps and cash bullion and bullion and coins. Um, and you have to determine how much percentage in each of these that you want to have. But you want to have a strong foundation because these are the ones that are going to withstand, say, a 50% sell-off. Um, and then mid-tier producers. Mid-tier producers, this is where you're going to have, I think, you know, you want to have like 25% somewhere in there. Personally, I do. And you're going to have a, a lot of mid-tier, I personally am going to have a lot of mid-tier producers, um, both um, on the low end, like a hundred million uh, area, 200 million area, a lot in there. And then, um, you know, three, four, five, six, all the way up. I'm just gonna um, just have a lot of producers because I pr really am a big fan or fan or believer that if we have a big run, a uh, bull market in gold and silver, that cash flow is really going to get revalued. And as the price of gold goes up, as the cash flow goes up, these companies are going to have stronger balance sheets, they're going to get valued higher. Like let's say it has a 5x, 5x uh, market cash flow valuation, it's going to go to 10, 15, 20. Uh, as the price of gold goes up, the companies are going to become more valuable. Um, and I, there's just I just think the mid tiers are going to produce a lot better than your large caps. When I say large cap, I'm really talking about $3 billion, right? At least $2 billion. And so mid tiers is anywhere from hundred million to 2 billion. Um, that's where I really want to have the meat of my uh, portfolio. Royalty plays uh, is another way to diver diversify. And some people could say that royalty should go higher than mid tiers, but I'm, uh, think that I actually think that ro the ro whole royalty model makes me a little nervous. So I actually have put them at higher risk than the, your mid-tier producers. 
and then down then develop now you're going to have less this, this is upside down pyramid this is the point of the pyramid so you're going to have a lot less development and exploration place um, and so this is where you have to decide you know how much money uh, allocate do you want to allocate to development and exploration um, and I think I only have 8% allocated to um, exploration and I think 18% to development uh, right in there. Um, I don't have any options or futures. These are just for the experienced investors. I have done some options in the past, um, yeah, but these are for the experienced, uh, only for experienced investors. You, you wanna learn this stuff really well before you start doing this stuff. Um, so you have to really have to decide, you know, how much do I wanna allocate in this area? Um, for some, from, you know, some really big gains, if you will. I mean, you can average five baggers in the mid tiers, um, average two to three baggers here in the large caps, but you really want to, you know, this is where you want to make some really, you know, have some 20 baggers, even in a 50 year bagger, you should get a few of these. That's why I have, um, you know, quite a bit to development stories. Um, cost basis allocation okay so um you don't want to allocate more than three percent of your total portfolio cost basis to a single stock um, unless it's a mutual fund or an etf etfs and mutual funds i think the risk level is enough where you can go higher than three percent um and it's up to you on what you want to allocate but i think um you don't have this this three percent rule but if you do, you can, if very few of your stocks, individual stocks should be 3% or higher cost basis. It makes me very uncomfortable. Um, I think I have one or two stocks at 3%. And the only reason they're at 3% is because uh, they merged with other companies and I just haven't sold shares. And I, when I first bought them, I bought them at 2% and they two of them have gotten up to three. And I feel very uncomfortable. But you can have you know one or two at 3%. But I, again, this should kind of happen by accident or there's one stock that you'd really like, but you want to be really careful on that. Uh, you want to try to keep quality producers between one and 2%. Um, and I only have a few over one and 1%. Uh, it's like quality producers, I'm comfortable with 1%. And then um, for the higher risk companies, um, I go less, below, less 1%. And I actually go down to, uh, you know, half a percent for the um, exploration plays. Very, yeah, I really never go over a half percent. I go down to a quarter percent on really high risk exploration plays. Um, allocation limits are only cost basis, not uh, not for increases in valuation. So if you have a company that had a cost basis of 1% and then it just blasts off and, you know, it's 10% of your portfolio, don't worry about it. You know, that's all profit. I mean, you can just, that's all about, uh, the, only the only time you sell is for a reason, not to reallocate money because you have too much allocated in one stock. That's not why. You want to allocate according to risk. Um, you want to um, you want to sell increases in valuation are prune sold uh, using your exit plan. So your exit plan determines when you sell a stock, not risk. So allocation is off by risk, and you always focus on cost basis allocation. That way you control your risk. Don't worry about your valuation overall valuations. Overall valuations is has to do with um, your uh, exit plan. So, and we'll talk about that um, in the next slide. Let's see, um, I'm gonna do a couple more slides and then we'll do the, I was gonna stop 28, but I'm gonna go a little bit further here. So the ideal number of stocks, this one kind of goes right into the pyramid. So I might as well talk about it. Um, the ideal number, what everybody kind of talks about is 25 to 30. Um, because of you, that kind of gives you, you can monitor that many and it gives you kind of exposure. Um, you know, if you do 10 or 15, it, it's kind of tough to get exposure. But the problem, 25 or 30 is really a really good allocation if you're going to trade. Um, 
and you're going to, a good trader is going to always make money, more money than somebody that buys and holds because you're going to constantly be weeding out your losers and kind of letting your winners, you know, run. And so you can end up with, you know, a lot of winners and get rid of you know, all of your dogs. You just tend to trade a lot when you only have 25 to 30 stocks. I think that's the ideal way if you want to make a lot of money, but it's tough. It's tough to be a trader. So I personally have a lot more because I'm not a trader. Um, so yeah, I mentioned it's going to limit your exposure 25, you know, you just, you know, how many um, 10 baggers are you going to find if you only have 25 to 30? You're just not going to find a lot of 10 baggers because you're not going to have that kind of risk. Uh, you're not, not going to take that many stocks that have a lot of risk. So to, to get a lot of exposure to high, high upside stocks, um, you're going to have to own about 50 or more. So I have more than 100 um, because that's kind of my investing style. I like to have low allocations and I like to have a lot of uh, exposure. So I'm going after, you know, going after five baggers and 10 baggers, mainly five baggers. Um, five baggers is kind of my, that's my kind of my focus, but I have a lot of three baggers as well to diversify out. Um, because I have so many, you know, kind of high risk stocks. Well, 8% expiration, 18% um, uh, development. So when you, it adds, um, it adds risk having a lot of stocks, but it also adds diversification. In other words, if I have a stock that has a half percent cost basis, I don't care if it goes to zero. Um, but if you have 25 to 30, you, you care if it goes down 25%. Um, and these are these stocks are so volatile. You have to determine, you know, what is your style. My style is to have low allocations, so that if, if the market's really uh, risk or really volatile, it really doesn't bother me as much. You know, it's like I know that my quality stocks are still there. They're going to come back, and these high risk stocks, yeah, they're going to get sold off. But I have such low allocation that it doesn't really bother me that much. Um, so you have to decide, you know, do you want to do 25 and, and kind of, and, and trade, or do you want to be a buy and hold investor with more exposure, or do you want to be something in between? So that's kind of your, what you have to decide. Um, investment strategies. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. That's what I, I got to go all the way. Now I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and, do this slide. I'm sorry. I keep telling you I'm going to stop and I keep going. Um, this is going to be our last one. Promise. So investment strategies. So buy and hold. Well, let me look at the next one. Oh, I got to do both. Maybe I should wait. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and cut this one off. We'll come back and we'll start here. We'll do part three.